Hello. We picked on the English yesterday, so I thought it was appropriate to pick on the French today. So this is a system against the French defence. So as white, if you kick off as e4, with e4 and the opponent plays the French, you might be thinking, oh no, he's going to undermine my pawn centre if I play the advanced variation. If I play the exchange variation, it's going to be a, a draw. And if, play, if I play the Tarash, you'll probably out theory me. So um, you might be depressed at move two. Well, there's no need to be. You can play in a novel way, and this will be good at least for your over the boards or you know blitz games as a great surprise weapon to occasionally bring out. So what I'm recommending with this video is the move B3. So as a surprise weapon, you know you're putting the opponent on their own resources. Uh, you'll hopefully be a little bit more familiar with the resources in the position. So the ideas of B3. So you'll have a nice bishop on this diagonal. So that's one idea. You'll allow black to win a pawn temporarily, your E pawn. Um, so it, it is a gambit. It's actually called the Retty Gambit, named after Richard Retty, one of the greatest hypermodernists in the hypermodern era of chess, who you know who, who created the opening knight f3. Retty, by the way, was also an enthusiastic uh, King's Gambit player himself, so he also did like this gambit, the Retty Gambit. So basically, the French defence player will naturally be inclined, usually, to play the move d5. So this will be our first illustrative game. I'm going to take it from a correspondence game played in 1998 between Alan Borwell, who is an honorary um, life president of the ICCF, the International Correspondence Chess Federation, and he was with the white play pieces, and he showed, you know, a great way of playing it. So he sacrificed the pawn and played knight c3, and after knight f6, he chose actually the move queen e2. Now, in another illustrative game I'll cover shortly, I'll be showing g4. But let's have a look at queen e2 with this video. His opponent played bishop b4. And Alan just castled queenside. And his opponent voluntarily gave up the dark squared bishop. So, materialistically, trying to sort of keep hold of the e-pawn. But after d takes c3, you know, white's got quite latent, latent power with this bishop, as we'll see. Not this on, just on this diagonal, but on this diagonal, as we'll see later. So queen e7, and now g4. So white's a pawn down, yes. But with g4, which is a thematic move in this opening, you're going to attack that e-pawn to try and regain it with the move bishop g2. And also, you're preserving threats of g5. So let's follow this illustrative game now. Queen c5. And now h4 was played. Very aggressive. So black played h6. Now Alan played bishop g2. Very logical. And after knight c6, he took on e4. Ribka thinks actually more accurate might be b4 here and then g5. Let's have a quick look at this. So b4, g5. And this kind of continuation would give white, according to Ribka, a good, solid advantage. So not just regaining the pawn, but regaining it with, with an advantage in this kind of variation. After queen e3, you know, white's solidly better. Say bishop takes h3, bishop takes h3, and look at black's king safety. And white's got all sorts of threats like b5, you know, undermining e5. So, in the game though, Alan, he took immediately on e4, and after h5, he played g5, so he gave up his light square bishop, and also sacking the f-pawn. But the f-pawn sack is a nice one, actually, because the black king's still in the centre, and he gains a temp on the black queen, and now plays c4. So we see that this latent bishop power coming into action, and the opponent tried to desperately close that diagonal, but now a brilliant move. Knight f4. So um, exploiting the pin, but also it's got another. It's got a brilliant idea behind it. It's not just the move itself. It's the idea behind it. After Bishop G4, Alan plays Knight G6. So not only sacrificing the exchange, but also offering the knight. The exchange was taken, so the opponent's a little bit materialistic, and his king trapped in the centre is now exposed to this Rook F1, followed by King G8. Now is forced, and now another forcing move. Check, another forcing move, check, and guess what? 
the other diagonal we'd spoken about earlier, comes into action now. White just played King B1, a silent but killer move, threatening Bishop C1 check, and actually mating. The opponent desperately tried to avoid this mate with Queen E3, allowing the Queen to be skewered, but uh, this is a hopeless cause now, especially after the next elegant move here, after taking the Rook, Queen F7, and that was it, black resigned. Black can't take because of G takes and the pawn is queening, the knight is helpless. Beautifully played game with an innovative opening system. Let's ha have a look at my own illustrative game next, which shows instead of this move queen e2, white also has his, his disposal g4. Okay, so against Andrew Stone, I played actually the move g4 here. And after h6, we see a similar idea, just bishop g2, trying to collect that pawn back. After bishop e7, I played h4, and Andrew played e5, and to this I just played g5. My slight weakness in this position is this f4 square, which he does probe now with this move knight d5, because do I really want to take on d5? I took actually on e4 and allowed knight f4, and I played queen f3. After knight c6, I played knight e2 to try and guard the d4 square. He played knight e6, and I castled queenside. He played h5. He's preparing to try and win the exchange in some variations with this bishop g4. Because after c3, he played knight f4. I took, and now he played bishop g4. Now, one of the resources I think is becoming apparent from these two game examples, is sometimes you have to be willing to sacrifice this rook on d1. And here I was, I sacrificed the exchange, just like Alan had done in his game. And for this, I got basically this nice pawn center, and these bishops are going to be working together. And in this system, this bishop is particularly important. If you have its friend on the opposite, opposite color, then you're not blind on one color. You can get these bishops working together beautifully sometimes. And this game could have been, you know, quite um, a magnificent masterpiece if only I had found the winning continuation later. So what I'll do is just show you where it became completely critical for black using this dark squared bishop and what the winning move would have been. The game actually ended in a draw, but um, with this battery on this diagonal, Andrew, you know, had to play very accurate defensive moves to be able to survive, especially after this d6 move. So I took now on b7 and played bishop d5, threatening now queen h8 mate. So you can see, if you can utilize this bishop on the diagonal, it can be a lethal weapon. Rook e6 was played. After queen d4, rook a6. He played c5. And in this position, after queen f4, this is very critical for black. I could have actually won the game on the spot now, according to Ribka, with rook e1. So this maximizes the pressure of this bishop, because if this blockading rook can be removed, then the queen returns to c3 with, you know, devastating threats. So, for example, rook takes, queen takes, and what can black do? If rook d6, then bishop e5. So there's no time for this rook d6 to be able to play rook takes d5. And if there's no time for that, then say queen d6, queen c3, and now how does black defend against queen h8 mate? Ribka's suggestion is just giving up the queen. So that's desperate. So basically this game fragment shows that if we use this system and use that bishop properly on b2, Sometimes, you know, we're going to try and regain this pawn, and sometimes we're going to be able to use the two bishops aggressively against the black king. So, potentially also, you're going to be sacrificing your rook on d1 in some lines, because it is a tactical target when you castle queenside. So here, the exchange down, but um, with great compensation, and the two bishops were working very well together against the black king. It just needed to find this precise move here, rook e1. Unfortunately, I played the inferior a4, and eventually the game was drawn, because Andrew managed to play rook d6 and rook takes d5. In quick summary and conclusion, then, after e4 and the opponent plays French defense, you can play b3 as an interesting idea, 
and Gambit the Pawn if black plays an immediate d5. By the way, if black plays an alternative like c5, look up the game of Aronian on Chess Live DE, or I can put it in the notes for this video. So there is a way of playing against c5, already you know shown by a top GM. But in the main line, if black plays d5 and d takes e4, this video highlighted two different ways of trying to regain your pawn. You can either play the move queen e2, or you can consider an immediate g4, which has the idea of bishop g2 trying to pick up your pawn with a small advantage usually if you regain it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.